quick disclaimer, we are not investigative journalists. We simply read, watch, and listen to whatever we can to satisfy our curiosity while use this information to form our own personal opinions. Do not take this as investigative journalism. This is simply our own rabbit holes. Hello, friends, and get ready. We're going to talk about the docs, the crimes, and all the people involved. This is Crime and Chill. Rachel, how are you? You know, freezing. Yeah, we're getting a little pre-winter here. For the south, it's fucking winter. We don't really get fall here. It's winter. It's cold. Winter. I'm loving it. I'm living my best life. My hands are cold. I'm not sad. My hands are cold. <laughs> this hand's nice and warm because I'm keeping it from my face. But this hand's cold. Not that you guys can see which either hand I'm shoving, but one hand's cold and one hand's not. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just sitting here with both hands pulled up into my sleeves because... I am cold. And I am cheap, and I refuse to turn on the heat in October. Yeah, it does seem a little ridiculous to turn on the heat right now. Yeah. Like, it's too early. Yeah. Yeah, no, not happening. But it's just going to heat up in a couple hours. We can hope. It's supposed to be like 70 something, right? Like, eight. It's still pretty chilly. It's chilly to you. The rest of us, it's kind of warm. Oh, that warm. I wonder if that's a different, like, you grew up in Jersey and it's different than here. No, it was that I was really, really fat before, and so I was used to having insulation, and now, like, I'm just chunk chunk, so I don't have enough insulation, and I'm not used to it. Is that why I'm okay? It's because I'm a little chunky? I'm still chunky. <laughs> I'm still chunky. My body just is still in shock. <laughs> All right. What you got for me for crime news today? I actually have two cases. Ooh. First case is really, I mean, they're both really sad, but as a mom, the first one's a little bit sadder to me. Okay. Um, so Erica Verdacia was went missing last month and it was very unusual for her. She has a six year old daughter. And unfortunately her body has been found. Her body was found in the canal in Florida. Who do you think her murderer was though? Oh, I know nothing about this. So if I had to guess I'm gonna was she married? No. Baby Daddy? No. Oh. Eric Pearson, who is a convicted murderer and was released on parole. In September of 2020, killed her. What? Yeah, and confessed to it. He had a prior arrest um, and served 24 years out of a 40-year sentence. And an arrest before that for aggravated assault. But yeah, he spent 27 years out of a 40-year sentence. Had only been out a year before he did it again. Okay. This is why there's constant arguments about parole. Because of shit like that. I mean... What the fuck? How do you get out of... You just spent forever in prison. You're going to go back? 27 years. Why would you... I don't care what this girl did. She could have chopped off my penis and I wouldn't have killed her because I wouldn't want to go back. No. What? Yep. That's insane. When her parents... When Erica's mother had called police, they kind of ignored the fact that she was missing and said she could have been anywhere. And then a witness placed her with... Eric and her mom googled Eric and found out he was convicted murderer and then finally got police and she started flipping out and police finally started looking for her but it was already too late at that point he had already killed her so I know it's hard when people are adults and you report them missing they're kind of like well they're kind of an adult so are we sure they're missing are they just kind of taking an MIA vacation because you and I are both guilty of taking MIA vacations like usually I'll let you know so you don't think I'm dead <laughs> You are the worst about not letting anybody know you're just taking a social media break, not responding to anybody, which is fine. I get it. But so, and this is why there's a lot of shit talking about police sometimes because shit like that happens. I and mean, it takes mama flipping her shit. Wait, where was her daughter? With the grandmother. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure. So daughter's alive. Oh yeah, daughter's alive. Okay. Yeah. That's why it was so unusual for her to be, you know, completely MIA. She wouldn't have just left her daughter. Yeah. Um, but the family does have a GoFundMe page to help support her daughter, and there looks like there's several. This one is made by her mother, though, to support um, her six-year-old daughter. We will link that below, because yes. unfortunately with GoFundMes, there's a lot of scam ones out there. So if we know, we can tell that this one is legitimate, we're going to make sure that one gets out. So yes, I will definitely save that. Then my second story, which is... 
just as terrifying, is about a real estate agent in Virginia. He goes to a house that he had just sold to one of his clients, 84-year-old Albert Balgoni. And Albert decides to shoot him. They think it's because he was unhappy with the house that he purchased and wanted to sell it back. And Soren, the real estate agent, went over there to try to help him feel better about his purchase. Albert decided that there was no feeling better about this house purchase and shot and killed real estate agent and then shot and killed himself. Before he took, called police, though. So he called police, police after he killed the real estate agent and then yeah. killed himself. Yes. You know, I have a lot of family members that are older. And they all say the same thing when it comes to getting older. They're like, life in prison is a lot less threatening the older you get. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't argue that point. I mean, I understand. It was a house. Just put it on the market. We're in a hot time where... That house was set in a heartbeat. He bought the house sight unseen. So it's kind of like how when we moved here. Yeah. Didn't know shit about it. Was very unhappy with this purchase. Wanted to get the house back. But it doesn't work like that. No. There isn't a seven day trial. Yeah. <laughs> um, that would be dope though. I mean, I think the real estate agent was trying to do the right thing by going over there and talking to the guy. But, but see, as a home care aide, my brain goes to, okay, he was 84. Was there dementia? Was there Alzheimer's? Was there something else going on? Not from the stories. Um, he just wasn't happy with that. And I guess at 84, when you buy something you're really unhappy with, then life feels like it's at the end anyways. You're like, fuck it. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Shit. Go out with him. Bang. Literally. Because, listen, I've had some sh go down with older clients. You know, it happens. Especially, you know, up in their 80s is more often than not where memory issues start to happen. And No, he remembered the real estate agent. Well, I'm glad he remembered the real estate agent enough to shoot him. Jesus. Just shot him. Anyways, though, that's all I got crime news today. Well, that was a ride. You know, I... So, real quick, because I was happy to hear about it. I don't know if anybody else is. Eric Smith was 13 when he murdered a four-year-old um, and has been in prison for ever at this point like he's oh 27 years because he went to prison in 1994 there you go <laughs> same age as me so he has finally been granted parole he will get out sometime in november it looks like yeah and i've seen interviews with this kid i've seen all this shit there was a lot of stuff going on we'll talk about him at some point but there was a lot of stuff that let like caused all that to happen and i i like that a child he was a child when he committed the crime, is being released because, again, he was a child. And at 13 was tried as an adult, which I don't know if I agree with that, but I do, but I don't. It's a complicated process. So yeah, that's a little bit of extra crime news because... How, do, how does the family of the four-year-old who was murdered feel? Last I saw, they had not made a comment. Hmm. They have been at all the poll hearings. So I'm assuming at the hearings, they're probably, I'd assume, you know, they're advocating against his release, as you would. And I don't blame them at all for that. But, you know, I think cases like that where he was 13, it's been 27 years. He has made statements. He has done interviews where he genuinely seems remorseful. I mean, after spending 27 years in prison, would you? Yeah, but he also... Like I said, he had a lot of mental issues that were not being dealt with. And I think getting the help for that in these in this prison system, that probably helped him a lot. And I really, really hope that he when he gets out, he's just going to try because he said before in multiple parole hearings that he's had before, he was he's not gonna go back to that town. He said he would not do that to the family that's cruel for them to have to see him in the same town they live in. So he would not go back there. He's acknowledging that it would hurt other people. Which is not something I've seen too often. So. I wonder what made them give parole. If the family was still against it. What. How are they able. You know. How can you sit there and override a family. Who's lost a child at the hands of this person. How did they go over. Or did they miss the hearing. Yeah. Like this could have been the one that they missed. Because other reasons. Or. You know, you never know. But yeah, that's just what I want to talk about. So, let's get into what we're talking about today. So, today's case, 
on today's documentary we watched I Love You Now Die. Which just the title alone is kind of <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. I um, mean, great title. Y- yeah. It was um, released on the HBO. On the HBO? <laughs> on the HBO. She crazy. She crazy. Before we get into the case, let's, let's tell the people, do we think they should watch it or not watch it? How many cigarettes? Oh my god. I was in with this documentary. I really, really liked it. I, I like, I, oh my god, there's so many good points I can make about it. There was interviews with the family. There was videos of the court proceedings. There was the text. Everything about it. I highly recommend. And I am giving this one a solid... I'm going to go 18. Which is funny, since this is more of a film festival recording. I know. So, that's what I was thinking. How you're going to read it, because... It is very film festival like like film festival i like people who don't have money to have the big yeah surprisingly for a more film festival style i actually fucking loved it i agree i think it was very good I, the case is hard for me to i have so many thoughts on this so like but the documentary itself i think is very good and before we get into the case i have to bring up the fact that there's a song on this case too oh my god okay there is also a song, so there's a song and plenty of documentaries about the case that we were talking about today. The case is with Conrad. Boy. Wait, what are you rating it? Uh, I'm going to say 16. 16? Wow, you're rating it lower than me. That's weird. <laughs> the only reason why is I think they, it was when you had to sit and watch. Yeah, you really could. Because you were reading text messages back and forth, um, as well as conversation that, that they were having throughout. Yeah. And I'm terrible at sit and watch. I have to rewatch several times then because I do better with listening. To do do something. Yeah, I can't do one thing. Yeah, I'm the same way. It goes out. So, but. You get about 10 minutes of my complete (laughs) utter focus before I have to start doing something else so my brain can handle. Yeah. I mean, even recording podcasts, I'm reading other crime stuff as I'm doing it. (laughs) I mean, for me, it was was good. I'm just going to say it was a 16. It's mainly because I had to read the text messages as I'm listening to the case. Let's jump into the case. Let's go. All right. So our case today um, that we watched in I Love You Now Die is about the death of Conrad Roy III. He was 18 years old when he took a pipe, like a hose, from his exhaust pipe and placed it into his car. Now, getting to that point is where the crime comes in. Whew. Just saying. Michelle Carter was Conrad Roy's quote unquote girlfriend at the time of death. They had all met a couple times, but they had sent and received thousands upon thousands of text messages over the course of their relationship. Which is an interesting way to have a relationship. And if it works for some people, that's interesting. And that's but like you don't see this person and you just have a relationship over text. So they saw each other Maybe about five calls. times in the course of the two years. That's not terrible, I guess. And at 18, I kind of think, like, if it didn't turn out the way it did, that would have built a solid communication relationship. You know what I mean? Like, communication is such a big part of a relationship. Yeah. And especially at that age, if they could have stayed that focused on each other, that only seeing each other five times in the course of two years. Yeah. I mean, do I, I think it's logical no no i don't as somebody that did the long distance thing it's I it mean, wasn't for me i watched my brother and sister-in-law do it for a couple years and they worked out great again they were also this young age though where yeah they were really doing what you should be doing at the beginning of a relationship yeah and when you're that young and you're next to each other all the time it's a lot different yeah you're not building something on an physical attraction as long, as, speaking as somebody that's been at my husband's ass since day fucking one <laughs> it took a while to build that communication and like get it right and we're still working on it five years into marriage later still working on the whole communication aspect i mean i know one couple that literally has no important conversations verbally I mean, all of their important conversations are done through text messaging yeah so i mean so for some it does work but Let's get into why Michelle is, or faced, and was charged 
with the death of Conrad Roy. Michelle Carter, bless her heart, she had, I don't know where she thought, I don't know. I think it's very sad um, that her her words were then used. She used her words to manipulate Roy. Yeah. It was very, that whole relationship, like you said, if it's like a communication and like it wouldn't have went the way it did, it would have been solid. But their communication was, what they discussed and how they were was very much toxic. Morbid. Yeah, morbid. Yep. Conrad suffered lots of mental health concerns. He was going to psychiatrists. His poor parents thought he was on track to do better. Uh, he started working with the family business. He had gotten his captain license just a couple months before, or a couple weeks before. So he was he was doing, or so they thought he was doing better. But behind his phone screen, he was telling Michelle otherwise. So pause to talk about the captain license thing. The portion of the documentary where they talk, where his grandmother's talking. Oh my god, my heart broke. He has such a pretty singing voice, too. Yes, his grandfather was the sweetest, or is the sweetest man ever. Like, yes, the parents and stuff was heartbreaking, and it did hurt because, you know, they're talking about losing a child. The grandfather, I cried. He got, he got tears. Like, the parents, I was like, oh man, that's god awful. And I was really, really sad, but hearing the grandfather talk about Conrad... Because, again, he was the third, so his grandfather was the first, then his dad was a junior, and he was the third. Fucking heart. What did they call him again, Al? It was something... I don't remember. It was super cute, like, being a third. Hold on. C3. That's what they called yeah, him. Yeah, C3. C3. I thought that was really cute. I mean, Conrad was very much loved by his family, even though his parents were divorced. I mean, he was loved. He was a good student. He graduated with honor roll. He played sports baseball he ran track he graduated high school with a 3.88 and um was accepted into a university university but he decided not to go so i mean he he had options in life and i think the toxic relationship with michelle is really what caused his mental health to never get better yeah um there's youtube videos where he is trying to find the good and make his life better unfortunately it did not work he was born August 11th of 1996 and was only 18 years old at the time of his death. Yeah, so young, sad. So the communications with Michelle was very much him being very vocal about his depression, being very vocal about how he knew he wasn't going to live. Like, he was going to kill himself at some point. And any normal person or sane person, I feel like if somebody was communicating that to me, I would be on the phone with their parents. I would be on the phone with local law enforcement, getting a wellness check. I because... mean, that's because you don't have mental health issues like Michelle does. Yeah, Michelle had a lot of mental health, has a lot of mental health issues, obviously. From as early as eight or nine years old, she was cutting herself, had eating disorders, was on psychiatric medicine by the time she was 14, and had attended counseling um, for her mental health issues. So the two of them together were just a toxic. Yeah toxic idea which i've noticed a lot and i'm not saying it's everybody but i've noticed that people that have like similar or something mental health issues that are together it's not it's pretty toxic and that's because they play off of each other yeah so i mean you are who you hang out with i'm a very empathetic person yeah oh yeah. um, so i purposely will i need a, again a social media break for me is because i cannot handle the constant emotions of everyone around me yeah and if somebody who's already having mental health issues is surrounding themselves with mental health issues even if they aren't empathetic it's still going to play a factor into how they view their lives yeah so let's talk about some of the texts so there was one that really stuck out to me i mean obviously other than the one that the ones that you know this case is built off of the ones that really stuck out to me were where they're talking about how if she ever has a son, she's going to name him after Conrad. And he is like, tell him all about me and blah, blah, blah. They were very much romanticizing this whole mental health issue stuff and romanticizing, you know, the fact that he was suicidal. He had attempted suicide once before. Yeah. So it was very romanticized. And it's just, I don't know why that one really stuck out to me of the whole 
if you have a son and you name him after me, tell him all about me, blah, 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 blah. Very much just different. And I just thought that was very, very weird. And then the other thing about Michelle and her mental health is she didn't live in reality. None of it was reality. None I of mean, it. what stuck out to me was her telling that girl she barely knew about Conrad being dead before he was even found. Yeah. Like, what? You know he's alive. Yeah. He was alive at that point, and she was telling somebody else that he was dead. It was, and what they said in the case was like she was testing out to see if she would gain the, the friendships that she was hoping for. Yeah. So Michelle really didn't have any friends. No. Like they were friendly inside of school, but outside of school, not friends, which I mean is sad. 100% that's sad. And that sucks. So there's points where you do feel kind of bad for Michelle as far as what was going on inside of her life. I mean, because a teenage girl that's going through all this shit, she doesn't have any real friends. That's horribly sad. Yeah. And it seems like those girls were friendly to her in school and all that, but they were, they had their own little clique and she just would insert herself. There's a girl I know like this. I don't know her anymore, but I knew her in school like this. And she would constantly, and I was so mean to her, constantly just trying to get into like our circle. But I was so mean to her. So I have a hard time looking back at that, of that kind of person that I was, and can see the pain that, well, she didn't look like she had any pain, but I know the pain I would have had yeah. from the way I treated her. So, I mean, I can see... I can see why Michelle was constantly trying to reach out to somebody and, you know, use this as a way for, oh, somebody will have to be my friend now. Yeah. So this is probably the only time you will ever hear me say this. So there's a segment in this documentary where they show the news proceedings after Michelle has been arrested and Nancy Grace is talking about her sourpuss face. I'm like, Nancy, you hit the spot. Because she was making... Okay, so... Michelle was arrested because after Conrad had committed suicide, the text messages between them where he set up the plan, she helped him set up the plan, and he set up his little thing in his truck, which would have given him carbon monoxide poisoning, and he had gotten out of the truck. He freaked out, got out, and she told him to get back in. Michelle straight up said, get back in the truck, which that resulted in him dying because he was that while it's still suicide it's different because she was telling him to do it yes the, the supreme uh judge in massachusetts said she acted with criminal intent um, when she encouraged him to get back into his car yeah so she was she ended up getting arrested for, I think it was like manslaughter or something. Yeah, involuntary manslaughter. Oh, that was her conviction, was involuntary manslaughter. And she was ordered to, what was it, 15 months in prison and then two and a half years suspended. Yeah. So when they're doing these initial court proceedings, Michelle was young. She Her looks drastically changed from the point when this started to the point when she went into prison. I will say that. Jesus Christ. But Nancy Grace is like, look at that sourpuss face she's got on, these faces she's making. Like, it's not da 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 I agreed with Nancy Grace for once. That's the only time I can ever think of that I've agreed with Nancy Grace. So I saw, but I only saw, like, the picture. I didn't see, like, the actual video because, you know, Nancy Grace just put a picture of it. Yeah. So, I mean, but think about how many, like, my thinking phase. Yeah. I don't do it on purpose, but it's just something that I do. Yeah. And it doesn't usually last that long. So if you were just taking a picture for a second instead of like an overall video to actual watch, you know what I mean? Yeah. But listen, and I that, was following this case when it happened. I so was I. So I did see more of that than just the picture. She was I making mean, some weird, pretty weird faces. Again, I, I have to go with also, she had a lot of social anxiety. She, had, she wasn't used to being with people honestly you know what i mean like she went to school but the spotlight being on her for somebody who's yeah. not used to ever getting attention even if it was negative attention it's kind of like when a toddler throws a tantrum it's some attention's better than no attention kind of thing yeah i mean no she great but she is great she is no longer in prison no so 
throughout this entire court proceeding, they're talking about the text, they're going back and forth, like, showing how they romanticized everything, showing her not living in reality, showing her, like, the texts of, um, I don't know if anybody else watched it, but I watched Glee religiously, so I knew exactly what they were talking about when they started talking about her obsession with, with Leah Michelle, who played Rachel Berry on Glee. I knew exactly what they were talking about because I was a Glee and I have no shame in my games. <laughs> I still will rewatch Glee in a heart because I love it. And, you know, they were 100% correct. She was taking word for word stuff that that character said in the show and saying it to Conrad. And it was crazy. So, like I said, she wasn't living in reality. She was medicated. There was a lot going on. Beyond wrong. It is very, very much wrong. But then you have to look, this is where, why this case was so widely talked about. Well, it was setting precedent. I mean, yeah. the whole case was setting case precedent, which if you don't know a case precedent, a case precedent is what's put into law books to allow you to charge people in the future with a crime using this as legal standing. So if you ever hear in court where they say, well, if you refer back to case XXY, you know, that mm -hmm. this was taken into account. So they were, the police's main goal was to get legal precedent on, on her. Mm -hmm. um, and they said that throughout the entire thing. Yeah. They, they had no shame. And we, no, we want legal precedent. We want this to be stuck. Because I think, you know, I don't know about the entire country, but I know state-wise, you know, if you tell that, but that, like I said, this is why it was so widely thought. Because if you tell somebody to kill you themselves and they do, should you be charged with a crime? If they, are the ones doing it. Well, let me ask you this. If you are trained in medical assistance, any kind of emergency medical, whether it be CPR, first aid, any of those things, you have a legal obligation that if you come up on the scene to help. Mm -hmm. And if you do not, you could be in trouble. Right. Um, why should that be any different as a person? We know as a people committing suicide and you do nothing about it. It should be taken just as serious as if you pulled the trigger yourself. Right. That person's reaching out to you, which most don't do before they commit suicide. You're having the ability. You're ha you she given the opportunity to stop it. And then on top of that, though, you have to also think at 17 years old, if it wasn't where he was get out, of, you know, tried to get out of the car, she pushed him back in or, mm -hmm. you know, told him to get back in. There's... There has been times where you're like, you say something, but you don't mean it. It's kind of like, yeah, shut up and just do it. Yeah. Like, stop talking about it already. Mm hmm And how many times has he tried to commit suicide prior? I mean, just weeks beforehand, he tried taking, like, I, uh, Tylenol or something. Yeah. And was trying to overdose. Back in 2012, he tried to overdose. So, I mean, or he tried to commit suicide. So, he has a repetitive habit. Mm hmm That... Well, I don't want to say the parents didn't do enough, what made you think he was better now? If just a couple weeks before he tried to commit suicide with acumenopine, what makes you think he was safe mentally at this point? Yeah, I agree. I also don't agree with what she did. I'm just saying, let's yeah. just playing devil's advocate. What are we doing as a society to protect people? We're so worried about green new deals. Why aren't we worried about people's mental health? Yeah. I, I agree. Like I said, we're not, when we talk, like, when we go back and forth and we're playing the devil's advocate portion, we 100% think she was wrong. 1,000% she, she was wrong. Wrong. But we're also I looking at both she, sides. And she served a reduced sentence of 15 months. I mean. Apparently she behaved a lot. <laughs> Apparently she was, like, a model inmate. Well, because she wasn't a vicious person. She was somebody suffering with mental health issues just like Conrad. Yep. And listen. Okay. And she was 17. The defense thing was they're talking about the medication she's on. She was on a medication called Celexa. I'm currently on that medication. <laughs> um, first of all, it's tremendously helped me. Granted, everybody reacts different to different medications. And you, if you even slightly watch TV, you have seen the medication for antidepressants. And you know that they sit there and they will say increased risk of suicide, increased risk of mental issues, increased risk of that, increased risk of that. It's not a secret that these pills that help with certain points of mental health can also make it worse. So for me, with her being young and her being on this medication, 
if she was regularly going to the doctor to check in and make sure like the medication was working properly, which you have to do if you're on any antidepressant or any, any kind of antipsychotic, then somebody should have noted something was going on because either she wasn't saying so or it was completely missed because that was the case. They could have took her off of that one and put her on a different one to see if it would have changed anything. I mean, I took medication for three months that made bugs feel like they were calling on me and no one knew. Like, you, you have to say things. If you don't, some people have a hard time communicating their problems, mm -hmm. even with a the therapist. I mean, I literally go to my psychiatrist every two months and she asks me X, Y, and Z and I just straight up lie because I don't want to get into it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's certain things that. It's like sometimes you gotta, you can't, can't say too much. Because you don't want to take grippy sock vacation. <laughs> I don't want to say like, oh, the psychiatrist should have noticed that this wasn't benefiting her. Yeah, that's what I'm because... saying. Like, I just think some, some she should have been saying something. The parents, did the parents not notice she was acting different? Was she not acting different? What was happening? So there's so many questions that need to be, that could be answered by like inside information. Because even in the like I mean, letters from her dad, his, her dad says, oh, well, I think it's his medication. Conrad's mom didn't even know that they were in a relationship for two years and that they had been, you know, she was like, oh, well, they, I know they text every once in a while. Yeah, she had no idea. Okay, I understand your child is 18 years old now, but this has been going on for two years. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know what was being communicated back and forth for over two years. You missed a lot then. I mean, and that's sad. We all as a mother hope that we're seeing everything for the detail that it is. Right. But to say that this is all Carter's fault or Michelle Carter's fault, I mean, yeah, she it's, is partially to blame. Yes. But so are you. You didn't say anything either. You didn't make sure he stayed an inpatient and, and got some more help because just a couple weeks beforehand, he was, did it then too. Yeah. So. It's, she's wrong for doing what she did. She's wrong for telling him to get back in the truck. She's wrong for encouraging the suicidal tendencies and the suicidal behavior. He was wrong for not speaking up and saying something was going on because his family already knew he had a history. So why not just say something? It's not like it would have been new information, you know, and it seemed like his parents genuinely would have helped him and got him help if he would have said, guys, I'm not okay. He claimed that his father was abusive as well as his grandfather. So yeah. Well, was he scared to say anything? Because that could have been an issue. Yeah, it very well could have been. We don't know because... There was a point where her, his father was arrested for assaulting him. Yep. So, but the mom, I, if that was the case and the mom to me seems like there was no issues with him between him and his mom, go to your mom. Again, the same mother who didn't even know that you were texted this woman, right. this girl, thousands and thousands of text messages back and forth. Yeah. Especially in 2012, 2013, 2014. That's when, back then, people still got their phone bill pretty much in the mail, and you saw who, the transactions. Yeah, what was going on and who yeah, was doing what. Taking a little off, but I can still pull up all of the phones on our plans, and I can see. Yeah, I do the same thing. Like, sometimes I'm like, I wonder how much I actually text, because I get curious. Yeah. But, like I said, what, backtracking a little bit with the Celexa and the medications, if somebody's on antidepressant, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, whatever it is, there has to be regular check-in. There has to be things being noted and checked on where, like with me, you know, you notice when something's not right because I can't hide it. I mean, he was on Selexa. Yeah, they were both on Selexa. Like I said, it works great, which is why I deal with the side effects I get. Like I have, I've always twitched, but now it's a lot, lot worse. Like I have a lot of involuntary movements. I'm okay with it because I'd rather do that as much as it freaking hurts hurts like it actually hurts a lot but as much as that hurts i'd rather deal with that than god knows how many panic attacks a day i can agree i think something like selexa though where it's known to cause suicidal behavior in children under the age of 24 yeah i do not think it should be prescribed to them there has to be something else yeah there has to be there's and the, for the judge to deny the request to hire an expert describing it of the side effects that it has on a child at the age of 24. Again, it's just more evidence of how mental health isn't taken seriously in a court of law. And uh, how Big Pharma has its nice grips on people. But even if Big Pharma, I mean, Big Pharma makes other kind of antidepressants. Yeah, there's a gazillion. There's more antidepressants. So many. So many. And I am sure there are so, I mean, 
there are some that would work. Like with my medication, I cannot take certain medication because it would cause suicidal risk. Yeah. So there's certain there's certain like cold medications I can't take. That's weird. But it just That's why you're so miserable. I never noticed that you don't take anything. No, 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 I don't take any medications just because I don't agree with oh. common cold medication. But that's just me. Unless I am to the point of turn and everything I've tried, such as I'm just crunchy, I can help it. It's okay to be crunchy. I just I love this new term of crunchy. I just don't like I was like ibuprofen maybe once a month. You take so much ibuprofen. I used to. I used to, but after research and my issues, I just she's not too everybody's different but you know there's so many different medications so if you're listen if you're currently listening to this and you were on a medication and it's making you feel some type of way go back to your doctor go back to your psychiatrist your therapist i personally get my selexa through my primary care go back to that doctor and tell them what's happening because they can put you on a different medication there's other things to try there's always something new to try i know for me it's a bug crawling medication it it had to get to the point that I was embarrassed to say anything because for one it wasn't listed as a side effect. Yeah, it was a new medication back then. It wasn't listed as a side effect. The only reason it was finally found, like somebody figured it out that something was wrong with me, was because I had to get taken home from work at fourteen years old. So for three months at fourteen, fifteen, fifteen. I dealt with this medication that literally made me feel like bugs were calling, just walking all over me all the time, all day long. Which, but I was like, have I need to say something. Right. Um, and then even when I did, the psychiatrist was looking at me like, that's not even a side effect. But for me, it was. Yeah. That's the thing. It might not be listed as a side effect, but that doesn't mean that that's. It's not listed as a side effect on that. But for me, it's still. It was a side effect. And I will not take it. So if it, even if you're taking a medication and you're having these weird things happen and it's not listed as a side effect, okay, it's okay. You need to say something that this is what's going on because what they're going to do is look at your medications and see, well, when did this start? Well, it was when this was added in. So let's test out and see if that relie relieves the issue because some things, it's certain things, it could be the medication or it could be something else is going on. Or it could be a chemical reaction. Yeah. Between and multiple medications. Everybody is different. Everybody is different. What like Selexa works for me. I don't mind the side effects. It's fine. I can deal with it. They're also now putting out medication that can help like my twitching. I'm intrigued and I am researching. But you know, there's a lot out there. So if you are listening and you are having issues with one of your medications, say something, please speak up. Tell somebody you're having problems. But anyway, this whole case just, like we said, it did very much set a legal precedent. It's exactly what was happening. They said from the get-go that's what they wanted to do. You know, that's just how it goes. And, and while it should have legal precedent, regardless of how they both had mental health issues, if you have a mental health issue and it's not being resolved outside of prison, get a lawyer who will, and you've done this, you know, you've caused some kind of suicide. Hopefully your lawyer will encourage you to seek treatment while in prison. But I 100% agree that it was not right for the judge to not allow some somebody to bring in scientific evidence research. Because he considered it speculative. Well, I mean, any kind of scientific evidence when it comes to mental health is speculative. There's no way, there's no way to, I mean, besides hooking up a lie detector test, which we've seen lie detector tests be proven to not always be correct. You can't tell how someone's feeling. You cannot tell somebody that they do not feel the way that they are describing. So yeah. you have to go speculatively into that and say, okay. I mean, while, well, yeah, you can hook up EKG machines to your head and check brain waves, but again, that's speculative. You have no way to prove that that wave means something different than this wave. Yeah. Like you said, most things like that, it is speculative. Just a, a lot of things are speculative. When it comes to scientific research, because and you can't also, say. A scientist wants to prove their theory and can make every which way of, of it being proved. So. I mean, like, there was a, what was it? Was it a doctor or a scientist that published a thing like it was facts and, like, straight up pretty much manipulated his research to show that vaccines caused autism. And that was stripped because he lied. It was not true. Mm-hmm. 
So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. And well, he was right in the fact that it was speculative, but I also think that that would have been helpful information for him to have because I don't think had they had more information about the medication, had they have known more about what it caused in people under a certain age, I don't think she would have been sentenced to prison. I mean, for what got, 15 months in prison. Yeah. I don't see how she could have gotten anything less because it wasn't, it wasn't like she had told people for prior attempts. You know what I mean? If she had told people prior attempts and nobody had taken it into account and then she was like, fuck it, I'm done. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But never to say anything prior. That's where my problem is. If she has done everything before this point and was just so fucking tired of dealing with the same issues over and over and over again, it's like, fuck it, do it. I would have a little bit more sympathy. Yeah. But she never once did it. So. And then here's the other thing where I'm like, bitch, you're crazy. She was texting his sister. Yeah. She knew he was dead. She knew he was in the truck dead. Yeah. She was texting his sister like she had no idea what was going on. She was sick. She is sick. I wonder where she is now. We didn't even look that up. Um, I did. I saw an article, but I didn't read them because I didn't care. So there is nothing stating she's very much stayed hidden. She's very much stayed out of the public eye. She was released, what, in January of 2020? Um, no, she went in in February. Yes, wait. It might have been January 2020. Yeah, January, 20, January 23rd, 2020. Yeah. So she spent less than a year total in there because she went in in February of 2019. Got out in January of 2020. And now has, like, she has, I think she has, like, two years of probation or something like that. There was a Hulu show too that I watched about her, which is like strictly about her. Oh. Um, I don't remember what it's called though. Well, if we find that, we'll link it. It was interesting. It would be. <laughs> so I think moral here for both of us, at least for me, I don't know about you, but I think we're both on the same page. She was completely and utterly wrong for what she did. It was not okay. It's never okay. Like I said, we understand the whole... You say things without meaning it, of somebody's repeatedly telling you they're going to do something, they're going to do something. Well, fuck it, do it, you know? And again, for me, if she would have said, prior to this incident, he needs help, he needs help, he needs help, he needs help, and he never got the help that he so-called needed, and she was just fed up with it. Yeah. I would have... Had more sympathy for her. Yep. I would have, too. And like I said, I had a little bit of sympathy for her because there was other stuff going on that does not excuse her behavior. And the other thing is she thrived on the attention she received after it was found that he was dead, after everybody knew everything. And she even told the girl, one of the girls that she talked to, that she could have, quote, stopped it in these text messages. Yeah. She could have stopped it. She could have called somebody. She knew where he was. She knew what he was doing. She could have called somebody. And she didn't. So she acknowledged that she did something wrong. Great that you can acknowledge it, but... Yeah. So... I anyway. um... A law, a bill was set up for Conrad, uh, which now it makes it punishable up to five years in prison if you intentionally coerce or encourage a person to commit or attempt to commit suicide by physical or mental coercion. So that makes sense. Again, I agree with that. Mm hmm. A hundred percent. Like I said, it's different of like Rachel said, if it's the repeated get help, get help, get help, get help. And, you know, you finally snap because that does also it's take a toll on your mental health. Yeah, it's it draining. draining to deal with somebody who's constantly complaining, especially when you have your own mental health issues that you're not complaining about, mainly because you're just me and you don't talk about your own shit. Yeah, same. To, to constantly have to hear and you're not doing anything to fix it. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't have sympathy anymore. Yeah. At some point, it is completely valid to lose that empathy and lose... It's not so much losing the empathy, it's more like for my own for my own sanity, I have to break away. Yeah. And I have 100% done that. 100% I have put a lot of time and effort into people trying to help them, and they would not help themselves. So I 100% stepped back. And, you know, I know some of those people still stalk me on social media, and I'm fine with that. I don't care. But if for some reason you are listening to this podcast, I don't have any ill will toward you. Because you know who you are. There's several of you, but that's the thing. If I've ever stepped back from anybody, I don't have any ill will towards them. I don't wish them bad things. Like, I don't know why sometimes it gets twisted that that's a thing of if you pull back from people, you know, you just hate them and blah, blah, blah. No, that's not the case. 
one of the cases is that you're that draining you... me you're making my mental health worse because i'm having to also take on your problem and you're, you're not, not helping yourself exactly if you're not helping yourself and you're not listening to what could work or even make an, an actual attempt that's what bothers me it's like you attempt it for two hours and you think okay well it should be fixed no that's not how life is nothing no. in life is going to be fixed that quickly even two weeks three weeks four weeks i don't care they even tell you when you get on these medications it could take months to actually start taking effect because it takes like a month for it to get built up in your system and then you know it's got to build up onto that you know things take time rome wasn't built in a day i mean people say that all the time that's literally what this is things are not going to get fixed in a day nothing that you are trying to fix that is going on in your life regardless of what it is is going to get fixed in a day that's just not how life is period so you might be like, oh all these people saying really the day blah, 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 you know kind of let it roll off your back you need to listen because it's facts of and if you can't listen within a setting that you're in you need to move yourself Yep. Whether that be to a mental health facility, whether that be to a friend's house for a couple of days. Like, removing yourself from a situation will encourage the situation you left to get better. And if it doesn't, then don't go back to that situation. And I say that, like, it's so easy, I understand. But at the end of the day, all you have is your, all you have is your, your capsule of the body. You know what I mean? Like, and however you treat that body is what you're going to get out of it. Mm-hmm. So thanks for coming to our TED talk. Yep, that's my TED talk. <laughs> Give one about once a month lately. So let's do some final thoughts here. Final thoughts for me. She was completely and utterly fucking wrong. You are completely wrong if you encourage somebody to commit suicide, not in the aspect of just being done with how the situation is, but in the aspect of like how she was, where she was actively pretty much telling him to kill himself multiple times. Up until yeah. this point where she told him to get back in the fucking truck. Me personally, if this was my boyfriend, if I was in this situation, first attempt didn't work, I'd be there. Second attempt didn't work, I'd be there. Third attempt, I'd still be there. Mm -hmm. But if the conversation is coming back to this and we're not doing anything to resolve. Yeah, or or find peace within what we have, I may have said, whatever, you do you boo, but I would not have picked up that phone again. Yeah. It was the constant antagonization for antagonizing mm -hmm. the situation. Instead of just saying, you know what, I'm fucking done. Like, I can't put up with this. Either do it or don't, but we're done. Yeah. It was the constant, you know, pushing him to do it. Yeah. That I have a problem with. Because, like I said, it was before this. She was like, are you going to do it today? When are you going to do it? When are you yeah. going? Blah, blah, blah. It was like she wanted him dead. Because she wanted the attention. She yeah. wanted these people to be her friends, and she... Decided that the I, only way they would be her friends is if something was bad was going on. And they didn't even live close. So why couldn't the lie have been that he's dead? And in reality, he could just be dead to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they don't know him. Yeah, they don't know him from Tom they Dick don't or Harry. Know you. So if you wanted that, that conversation of somebody having your back, why don't you just say he was dead and speak to him again? There was other ways to go about it. Again, we're acknowledging the fact that she had mental health issues that probably took away that logical thinking and the fact that she doesn't have to load because she's only 17 at the time of this yeah we've talked before about how age does play a large role in how things happen and why they happen so since she's completely wrong it is 100 percent okay to take step back steps back from people that are draining your mental health because they are not helping their own mental health and they are just dumping on you it's okay and it's okay to be a, like that vent person because rachel and i vent to each other all the time we will vent when we're frustrated, something's going on, but I also, like, because I'm scared of being that person, <laughs> that I'm draining somebody, I don't go uh -huh. into much detail. Like, if something's, if I'm, like, having a really bad depressed day, or I'm, like, really upset about something, I'll tell you and, like, acknowledge it, but... I'm not going into detail. No, I'm, we're not, we don't go into detail. But that's just me. Like, I just don't, I have a hard time communicating what's inside the tornado I call a brain. Yeah, 100%. I can't. I can tell you, like, I will try to put a label on a feeling, but that's, I don't, I can't identify it half the time what's happening. I just know my brain feels a certain way. I feel a certain way, but I hate, I hate, hate, hate. This is something else you guys have to understand. You do not have to have a reason to feel the way you're feeling. If you are having a depressed day or you're just depressed in general, 
you don't have to have a reason. I hate when somebody's like, well, why are you depressed? Well, why are you anxious? I don't have a fucking reason 90% of the time. There is nothing I can tell you that is specifically wrong that is causing some the way I'm feeling. It's just how my brain operates. I have, like, I've been talked about it before. I have CPTSD. I have anxiety. I have depression. I can't label things. And that's okay. And it's okay if you also can't label things. And you just need to say, hey, here's where I'm at, but I don't have, I don't know why. So just remember, because I see this all the time, everybody's like, well, free speech, your words do have consequences. You do not get to tell somebody to just kill themselves, like explicitly say, well, just go fucking kill yourself. You can't do that. You cannot do that. Do not, and you shouldn't do it, because I can't imagine telling somebody to just kill themselves. Rachel's like, I have. <laughs> that faceless, I have said it, has come out of my mouth. Time and place. Yeah. Time and place. You know the person that you're talking to. If that person is discussing that with you, you know this person well enough. Time and place. But just remember your actions, your words have consequences. Seek help if you are having any health, health, health issues. We are very much mental health advocates over here that will scream from the rooftops to get you what you need. We have said it before. We will say it again. All of our socials are open. You can message us. We will talk to you. And we will help you the best of our abilities. Yeah, overall, this case was just not a good one. Nobody, regardless of, huh? Nobody won. Yeah, nobody won. Regardless of if she, that she went to jail or not, everybody loses. This is not something where justice was served or anything along those lines. Which, to his family, it might have felt that way. But then you also have to remember the other side where she is a human. She has family. They lose. This isn't a win-win, a win-lose. It's a lose-lose because Conrad is still dead. There's no bringing him back. She went to jail. She's out now. I guess the only thing that won was that there, are, there is a bill where if you actively convince someone to commit suicide, you will be charged for up to five years in prison. Yeah. So that's the only good thing that came out of this. Janice Roy, which is Conrad's grandmother, did have a statement the day she was released from prison. Her statement reads, It's hard to understand how anyone could do such a thing. I just hope the jail time did, her, did good for her, maybe changed her outlooks on things. My grandson's gone, and we're very sad about that. That took a lot of compassion. Mm -hmm. Even if she doesn't feel compassionate towards Michelle Carter. The fact that she made a statement saying she just hopes it did, you know, change something for her. Yeah. Her grandmother did have, his grandmother did have passion. But she is out. That is the end. Yep. And unless something happens, which I highly doubt anything the worse lawyer, can happen with this. Yeah, the lawyer um, does have future legal plans to announce. Uh, he has not announced anything yet. Who's the lawyer? Michelle Carter's. Okay. His name is Joseph P. Cal Catalato. 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 I was going to be like, I've heard that before, but it's just because I've watched like four documentaries at least. <laughs> so, he's been her attorney the entire time. Yeah. So, any final thoughts you want to add or you think covered it all? My only final thought is these attorneys that handle these high profile cases that end up like they do, how rich do you think they get from them? Oh my like, God. Afterwards? Like, how likely would you be to pick this attorney because you've seen him other criminal cases that are... Yeah. Setting precedent. So he made a shit ton of money from the family, and he's still making money from the family because he's still her lawyer. Yeah, he's still retained. So... Which means they pay a fee to keep him retained. Even if he does nothing. Yeah, so even if there's nothing happening, and he's just hanging out in his office, he's getting paid by her family. He's probably getting paid anything that he does in these documentaries where he talks. He's probably paid for that. And then, you know, people are like, oh, public name, I know that name, so they pick him for their lawyer. So he's probably rolling in the dough. I'm not going to lie. He's had several high-profile cases in the past. Wow. Uh, Michelle Carter is, you know, the one that we would all know as crime freaks. But in the state of Massachusetts, he is a very... Well-known lawyer. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, and all of his cases prior to her were usually litigation. You know, it's criminal litigation. So... I think that's all in this case. We're going to... Let it go and let it rest. And again, we will link mental health things in the descriptions. 
we always want everybody to help. We think that you, if you get, we want you to get help. We want you to speak out. So on that note, thanks for joining us this week. We can't wait to see you guys next week. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Crime and Chill Fam, to talk all the crime with us and give us your input on these cases we talk about. Because we like hearing other people's opinions. We think it's fun. Follow us on the Tickety of Talk, Instagram, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel, Crime and Chill Podcast. Find us everywhere. Follow us, subscribe, do the things so you never miss out on anything that we have going. All right, well, we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.